The book is The Whitlam Legacy, and the editor, Troy Bramston, joins me in the breakfast studio. Troy, good morning. Good morning, Fran. The book starts with a short contribution from the man himself. He calls it his valedictory message to the ALP. Sure. Look, Gough Whitlam, as you say, Fran, is 97 these days. He doesn't give interviews anymore. He's no longer writing essays. And so he decided to term what is his forward to this book as his valedictory message, particularly to the Labor Party. And he has three things he wants to say, and that is that it can learn from its history, its its successes and its failures, including those uh, while he was Prime Minister. He also has a phrase that he thinks sums up his contribution to public life, which is contemporary relevance. That is, that political parties must continue to be relevant to voters and they must continue to refresh their ideas. And finally, he wants the Labor Party to reclaim uh, the importance of Parliament, what he calls the primacy of Parliament in developing, explaining and defending policies. And he wrote it during the last year of the Julia Gillard government, which was a tumultuous period in Australian politics. And I think Gough came to the conclusion that if only politicians use the parliament more, um, then policies would not be blown off course, as he called it. One of the criticisms of certainly the last Labor government was it didn't sell its narrative. So was he observing that and thinking they just wasted that platform of the parliament? I think he was looking at the at the parliament and he was looking at the chaotic nature of it all and a number of broken policy promises and thinking to himself, look, if only the Labor Party was sure more about what it wanted to achieve and why it wanted to achieve it and then it could explain those policies and defend them in the parliament, the primary forum for Australian politics, uh, then maybe we wouldn't have seen some of these backflips on things like carbon tax um, and watering down the mining tax and a number of other policies that became very contentious in the past few years. In this book, you've amassed a who's who of contributors. What are the competing arguments in this book, Troy? Well, I wanted everybody to have their say, people who were friends and some who I guess may describe themselves as foes, uh, people who wanted to have uh, their say about Gough Whitlam 40 years after he was elected. Um, but it's not supposed to be a whitewash. There are warts on all accounts in this book. Um, but I think the theme that runs through the book that I can draw out is uh, the Whitlam legacy, which I think still endures in Australian politics. And I, I put it down to three things, Fran. And the first one is obviously he saved the Labor Party, I think, from oblivion. He's reformed to the Labor Party. Party structures, his renovation of its policies in the late 1960s saved the Labor Party in Australian politics. The second thing is, interestingly, he came to power uh, during the 1960s and when he took over the leadership of the Labor Party and then became Prime Minister. So modern politics, I think, begins with the Whitlam era. What does that mean? television. I mean, Gough Whitlam mastered that art. If you look at some of that old footage of politicians, you know, from the 30s and 40s trying to deal with this medium in the 1960s, they were very uncomfortable. Um, you know, Billy McMahon wasn't a great television performer, um, neither was Arthur Corwell, who Whitlam replaced as Labor leader. So he mastered that forum, which really changed politics. But also things like professional advertising, you know, the It's Time jingle, the It's Time uh, election campaign, also detailed market research, using polling companies, using focus groups to fine-tune policies to better shape your message. And also professionalised campaigning, candidate training, target seats, all this kind of stuff. Some of that say that's a scourge of politics these days, all those things. Market research, politicians are too poll-driven, they're too slick, advertising campaigns are too slick. Sure, but nevertheless, these are things that change politics all over the world. Um, and politicians who could use them effectively succeeded, and those who didn't obviously failed really the most important, and that is the policy legacy. We live with this legacy all around us today, from universal health care in Medibank, now Medicare, needs-based school funding, reorientation of Australian foreign policy, particularly uh, the recognition of China, which is now our greatest trading partner, but also the legal reforms. I mean, there are breathtaking reforms when you consider them for a second, things like lowering the voting age to 18 years of age, territory senators, one value, one vote, electoral laws, the abolition of the death penalty, no-fault divorce, legal aid, uh, abolishing the last vestiges of white Australia policy. Um, there's a whole lot of things that the Whitlam government did, even sewering the suburbs um, in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. The list is staggeringly long, considering the Whitlam government only lasted just over a 1,000 days. It's a lot to be going, get going in those days, and I think no-one argues with the, the breadth and the scope of that list. But plenty do argue with the capacity to implement all of those ideas. Um, and the Whitlam government was also marked by political scandal, especially his second government. Now, Paul Keating was very briefly in that cabinet, the second cabinet. He remembered the atmosphere in the room there in his interview series with Kerry O'Brien. Let's have a listen. Well, it was thrills and spills, you know, I think. And there was a big emphasis on the thrills because, you know, it was a very reforming government. What can you remember of your first 
ministerial meeting with the full Whitlam ministry? Oh, well, it was a, it was a bag of fun, really. <laughs> I walked into this little ante room they had off the cabinet room in the old parliament house where you had a cup of tea and a scone. No one said a word to you. No welcomes, nothing. You're just there, you picked up your cup of tea and had it and looked at the papers. So I sat down and uh, then there was a, a, long, a long dissertation by Kep Enderby. He had this very quick style of speech and it went on. I saw Goff grimacing up there going, you know, annoyed. And then finally it gets the better of him. And he says, Enderby, you garrulous so-and-so, when will you shut up? And Enderby says, what, me? He said, yes, you. And Bryant, Gordon Bryant, another minister, says, you shouldn't speak to him like that. He said, you shut up. <laughs> don't, she, and don't speak to me like that either, says, says Bryant back. You know. What do you take from that, Troy? Was division or personal animosity a feature of the Whitlam government or was it just the wheels falling off? Look, it was absolutely a chaotic time. I mean, the Whitlam government could have been much better in terms of managing itself administratively. Um, it would have been better if there weren't those scandals. The loans affair was an absurd, ridiculous um, scandal with the attempt to borrow US $4 billion from a Pakistani commodities trader. It's unthinkable um, today, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. And they spent too much money. They spent it too quickly. The size of the public sector grew. But, you know, these things should not cloud out the broader legacy. And what I've tried to do in this book after 40 years is let's look at all these things together. And yes, it was a chaotic and often shambolic government, but it still left, despite all that, an incredible legacy of policy achievement. Mm. Is it fair to say that Labor has suffered from a perception since that it's not, you know, the best manager of the economy? Is that, a, is that one of the throwbacks? Yeah, look, it, it, it is. And certainly, um, you know, Susan Ryan often used to tell me that in the Hawke government, when she sat around the cabinet table, there was no place for an unreconstructed Whitlamite. Um, yet in their other moments, both Paul Keating and Bob Hawke have said, look, without Gough, we wouldn't be here today. They said that when they were running the country in the 1980s and 1990s. And it gets back to that other point we talked about, about he's changing the Labor mm. Party and making it electable again. So, yes, there's all the Whitlamites, there's that legacy, a whole generation who came in inspired um, to politics by Gough Whitlam and those big ideas and yet today it's almost an insult isn't it that people I remember uh, the coalition kept on describing you know the last Labor government as the worst government since Whitlam you know the worst Prime Minister since Whitlam, all these kind of comments. Yeah, and I think, I think it's very unfair. I think it's a, a comment that ignores sheer facts. I mean, we've talked about some of them, whether it's China, healthcare, schools funding, the legal reforms, even, you know, removing the final troops from, from Vietnam, freeing conscientious objectors from prison, um, the new national anthem. I mean, we can go on all day, Fran, and talk about these achievements. And the thing is that, you know, they were done. So when the Whitlam government went out in 1975 with the dismissal, Medibank was up and running. Now, Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd might like to talk about the National Disability Insurance Scheme or the Gonski funding being done and his achievements. Well, mm. frankly, they're not. But the Whitlam government did achieve things and they were funded and they were in place before they were dismissed on Remembrance Day 1975. And that is a great reminder that you remind us of in this book, the pace that he went at it from day one. He surprised everyone by sitting down with just, you know, whether the member and, and running the country and getting these ideas going. It's a great reminder. Troy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, friend. Troy Bramston, editor of The Whitlam Legacy. Whitlam Legacy.